my name's Tony Taylor, and you're stuck with me for today, I'm afraid. I am not a historian, uh, I'm an engineer, but it's one of the volunteers here. Um, but uh, when you volunteer here, here, you pick up a bit of history as you go along. Sorry, could you speak up a little bit? Okay. Um, now, uh, do, we, do any of you know who Erasmus Darwin is? No. 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 He was the grandfather of Charles Darwin. Oh. Um, he never met Charles uh, because he was dead about a few years before Charles was born. But Erasmus was a doctor of medicine and he lived in this house uh, from 1758 till 1781. He was born at Elston Hall near Newark uh, and went to Chesterfield Grammar School uh, and then to St John's College, Cambridge, where he gained a Bachelor of Medicine degree. And then he travelled to Edinburgh, to the Edinburgh School of Anatomy, which later on, another 50, 60 years later, became famous because of the Burke and Hare uh, resurrectionists. Because everybody training to be a doctor needed to study anatomy, and there was a desperate shortage of, of bodies to dissect and uh, investigate to find out how the body <coughs> He went to uh, Edinburgh then, he started Excuse his... Excuse me a minute, can I just stop you? Do you mind if I leave, please? I can't hear. Are, am I all right to walk around? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, do you want to... Are you okay if I really, really step the volume up? No, Sorry, I'm I've got these as well. No, I, I don't <laughs> you sure? Thank you anyway. Okay. See you yeah. soon. All right. Um, so, uh, what have I got to say? Yes. Uh, so he, he studied anatomy in, in, um, in Edinburgh, but towards the end of his course, um, his father, who was a wealthy solicitor, inherited an entailed property, decided to give up his occupation as a solicitor, so he virtually said to Erasmus, you're on your own, you have to finance your own education now. So Erasmus, uh, although we know from the university records he did a thesis, but he didn't actually get a degree. He didn't collect his certificate. Uh, but he came back to Nottingham, uh, because that was fairly near where he was brought up, and he set up practice as a doctor. Now, of course, in those days, you had to advertise to be a doctor. You had to have a letter of introduction to various people. Otherwise, they wouldn't come to you as a doctor, uh, because the family doctors, uh, they followed on the sons of the doctors were doctors in themselves and the family stayed with them. Um, so Erasmus was frozen out by the local doctors, but he, so he came to Litchfield. He came to Litchfield because he got two letters of introduction. One was to Canon Seward, who was the senior canon living in the close here, um, and the other letter of introduction was to Lady Greasley, who was the local leader of the aristocracy. Um, obviously he came here and Canon St. the Sea would uh, change over to him as a doctor because of the recommendation he had from one of his tutors at Cambridge. And Canon C would, uh, gave, he became a patient. And then I think members of the clergy and then probably all the members of the congregation well, if it's good enough for the canon, it's good enough for me. And so they gradually flocked to this new doctor. And in the same way, the society ladies of Litchfield would, well, if it's good enough for Lady Greasley, we'll go to this new doctor. And he very quickly built up a very good practice as a doctor. Um, he uh, didn't live here when he came in 1756. He had a board, he lived in a boarding house in Litchfield itself and his sister came and acted as his housekeeper. Um, but very soon, having, with his association with the close, um, he um, courted a girl who lived in the close. Now, when I say the close, it is, um, as you, well, you know, I understand you've had a, probably an outside look at the cathedral. Um, the cathedral in Norman times had an enormous wall all the way round, completely protected by drawbridges, um, uh, there were no portcullis, there wasn't a portcullis, uh, but drawbridges, and it was, there was a moat, a dry, wet moat all the way around the cathedral. Um, 
And this was purely to protect the Roman Catholic pilgrims, because of course it's a Roman Catholic cathedral. Yeah, sure. Um, so it, it, at night there was a curfew, the gates were closed, and it was a protected area. Uh, because of the, there were a lot of Saxons about. Just imagine that we, we, we're back in the Brexit, really, aren't we? Because <laughs> we are the immigrants, the Nor we're descended from the Normans, and the Saxons didn't like it, but that, that's what it was done for. Um, Roger de Clinton was bishop, and he built that wall around there, um, and by 1135 the wall had been completed, there was a, a hospital, a St. John's Hospice, I don't mean hospital in the sense we have hospital now, a hospice, it was somewhere where people could stay safely. That was built outside the walls and that was opened at 11, in 1135 as well. So uh, we've got this enormous wall right round there. Now at the moment this house is built more or less where that tower is. So this house had enormous building problems on the minute. Here. Um, and when, if, if ever you come some other time, we haven't got time today, is, and have a look at the cellars, you'll find one of the big problems is we've got the remains of a massive wall that goes right through all these houses down on the ground. Inside the close, there were a lot of people living. Um, all these pilgrims came. The gates were closed at night, so there had to be somewhere for them to eat, somewhere for them to sleep. Um, there was a butchers, bakers, and there were, were houses here, and a lot of clerk, a lot of clerk at that time. Being Roman Catholic, there were a lot of chantry priests, and, and a lot more than we do have today. So it was almost a society or a city within a city. So there was great pressure on the buildings. So after another couple of hundred years or so, there were cellars under all of those buildings. And part of this house dates from, uh, the cellars certainly date from that time. So although this is a Georgian mansion, one half of our cellars here go back to the 13th century. Um, and the other part of the house was built by Darwin. The, in the close was living uh, Howard, Charles Howard, the uh, proctor, solicitor. He was, uh, belonged to the Litchfield Ecclesiastical Court and a very wealthy guy and his daughter Mary Howard when Erasmus arrived here there was Mary Howard living in the close that's where that that wall was called the close which is where you are now sort of thing um, there was Mary Howard and also Canon Seward's daughter uh, Anne Seward now these two Anne was only about 14 but Mary was 18 um, and these two young ladies were the society ladies living in the close and suddenly this young doctor arrives <laughs> instead of all these either single uh, priests or um, and by now of course it was an Anglican cathedral, uh, married priests or priests and uh, several old priests and serious guys that suddenly had to be young <laughs> doctor came. Um, obviously Anne was uh, I think from her poetry we can gather she had a bit of a crush on this, this doctor, but it was Mary, he married Mary. And he did something that I never did, and I don't think, I don't know, maybe one of you chaps have done this, but um, uh, Erasmus had a dowry of a thousand pounds cash, which is roughly about 120,000 pounds today. Um, now and with that, he decided to uh, build, or at least with some of it, to build a house. When he arrived, when he got married in 17, he arrived in Litchfield in 1756, he got married in 1757. In 1758, he managed to start this building, this house, this part of the house. But when he got married, he rented from chapters, that's the cathedral authorities, three Tudor-type houses along there. As you go back towards the cathedral, you'll see some timber, um, red brick infilling timber, typical Tudor buildings. Um, those have been replaced by Bishop Hackett after the Civil War, because during the Civil War, and that picture of the cathedral, in actual fact, the spire, the centre spire there is missing, because uh, Oliver Cromwell, you can pass that right if you want to Oliver Cromwell, um, uh, 
occupied the cathedral and they had horse racings in the nave. Now, when you go in the cathedral, have a look around. You'll see a lot of little statues and a lot of little figures have all got their noses off. Um, now, the cathedral guides, um, I'm a steward at the cathedral, not a guide, you know, and they're, oh, they're, they're all very jealous of their different areas, so you have to be very careful. But the guides there say that the, uh, the roundheads chopped chop the noses off out of spite because they didn't like it. No. Um, it, it, their swords were their most valuable weapon. What they did was sharpen their swords on the noses because it's our ideal for having a sword. That's why they got worn down. It, it would be like, you know, trying to bend in your rifle in World War II. Your rifle was your own defence just as your sword was your own defence. 